Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to another episode of Scared to Death, Creeps and Peepers. I'm Dan. Hi, I'm Lindsay, and I'm real shiny today. Hello, hello shiny Lindsay. <laughs> uh, YouTube viewers, be sure and check the screen right now to ch- see this week's 20% off merch discount code. Good on everything except for the book. Cool. Also, another super cool shirt in the badmagicmerch.com store. Uh, a black Scullington shirt. You just have to check out to understand how fantastic it really is. Okay. Uh, trying to get to the stories as soon as possible, but we, but we do have two really important timely announcements today. Yes. So, as some of you know, if you're following us on social media in any capacity, that producer Joe has been knocked down by the Rona. So, mm-hmm. today, the show... Yeah, Joe's been really sick, you guys. I mean, like... In and out of the ER. Yeah, two times in the ER, currently investigating a possible blood clot. Like, Mm -hmm. Joe is sick. So... No joke. We're sending him lots of love and well wishes and all the things. I offered to bring him crystals. He said, no thanks. That was (laughs) fucking rude. Uh, So, this week, we have producer Zach, who is sometimes out there anyways. Mm -hmm. But, uh, like, huge thanks to Zach for just, like, extra hours, stepping it up, and um, just, you know, being a part of the team. And we have so many policies and procedures in place like we're being so safe easy for dan and i to do this so close together Mm -hmm. because you know we swap spit all the time and And we've already gotten tested uh, so we'll know soon if we have it yeah Yeah. oh that swab was Mm -hmm. but if if you want to send joe some love you can find him on the insta at reverend dr paisley okay so you're like what so it's r e v like victor d r P A I S L E Y. Mm-hmm. Rev Dr. Paisley. It's a yeah. joke from Time Suck. I'm sure he would love to hear from everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. And other big announcement. I'm going to try and do it without crying. Yeah. You guys, I had no idea how much you wanted that book. Kate and I, like, busting ass, not that Dan and Logan didn't help, like, as a whole team effort, but um, we were like, oh, pre order, like, we hope we get a couple hundred. The numbers are insane. I can't mm-hmm. even believe it. It's, yeah, thank you guys. I, I didn't. I didn't know so many of you loved us. <laughs> I didn't know like how broad our reach was. So I'm just. I'm teary eyed. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, can't do it without you guys. And for those of you, there are a few of you. I feel like writing your name on the blackboard, but I'm not going to. Okay, I have about 20 of you who have not filled out your releases. You haven't gotten back to our email. So please, please, please check your email. Chunk your check your junk mail. And again, that email is book at scared to death podcast.com. If you heard your story read on this show in the last year, make sure you email us and let us know if we can use it. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And I saw a little sneak peek of the books and they are amazing. I mean, yeah, Logan's killing it. Uh, okay, so how many listener tales do you have for us today, Lindsay? I have two, uh, a, a, a probable possible haunted house okay. and a definitely haunted cave. Okay, okay, cave, interesting. Uh-huh. Very interesting. All right, I like that. Uh, I have two, of course. Uh, missing time, the theme of my stories today, of both stories. So that's okay. kind of a, a little twist. Claim of alien abduction is the focus of the second story for sure and is one of many possibilities for the first very strange story. Oh, boy. You know how I feel about aliens. Oh, I know. Yeah, these are these are going to creep you out. Cool. Thanks, Dan. So You're so little, great. So a little bit of setup on the first one. While you get comfortable, I'll start setting it up. Okay, sounds good. I, I've got my OG unicorn socks on, just uh, <laughs> for those of you who care. Check that out. All right, here we go. <laughs> Located in the northwestern part of Romania, in Transylvania, actually, just a short distance from the modern Romanian city of Cluj, fourth biggest city in Romania with roughly 400,000 people living in the metro area, lies what many refer to as the world's most haunted forest. Known as Hoya Bachu, this creepy, dark, and dense forest, pretty tiny as forests go. It only encompasses 729 acres, barely bigger than a single square mile, less than a half mile wide at its thickest point. At no point is the forest more than a couple hundred yards from a nearby road, and yet, in paranormal circles, Hoya Bachu, the forest, is one of the most infamous forests in the world. Every time you say it, I get the chills. Part of it, weird. 
Part of its reputation may come from the way the, uh, these woods look. Fog is not uncommon, and Hoyabachu is famous for having trees that grow in an incredibly unnatural and dreamlike fashion. Trees tend to twist for reasons not fully understood. They bend into spiraled shapes. Some trees eventually end up leaning over on top of themselves. I'll have pictures of these trees at the end of the story. Super creepy. Okay. Uh, are so many tales of ghost encounters, UFO sightings, strange disappearances, speculation about interdimensional portals, and more at Hoyabachu uh, because of this? Are they because of this forest's unusual appearance? Or do these woods look unusual because there truly is something unusual about them? Something that has very little to do with misshapen trees. The first scary legend associated with Hoyabachu is the one that gave the forest its name. Okay. According to local lore, many, many years ago, a local shepherd named Hoyabachu entered the forest with around 200 sheep, and then no one ever saw him again or any of his sheep. I think I've heard this story before. Seriously? I think so. The shepherd and his entire flock had somehow just disappeared without a trace in this small and really not that remote patch of forest. Mm-hmm. Many more similar stories followed. Perhaps the most famous disappearance example is that of a young five-year-old girl. She, like the shepherd before her, is said to have wandered off into Hoyabachu and then disappeared without a trace. But unlike the shepherd, she didn't vanish forever. Allegedly, a year later, she wandered back out of the forest, still dressed in the same clothing she'd worn the day she went missing. Shut the front door. She was confused when questioned about where she'd been. She thought she'd only been gone a few minutes. She had no recollection of where she disappeared to or what had happened to her. Creepy. The little girl's story remains a mystery, as do countless other stories. Urban legends? Perhaps. But there are so many of these legends, are they all made up? Some believe that Hoyabachu, the forest, contains some sort of portal to another dimension, and that this is how people disappear when they vanish. Due to legends of so many of these disappearances, the forest has acquired the nickname the Bermuda Triangle of Romania. Okay. For many years, most of the stories about this forest stayed in Transylvania, but then Hoyabachu became internationally known in 1968 when a man named Emil Barnia, a military technician, photographed what he claimed was a UFO hovering over what's called the clearing. Uh uh-uh. uh. The clearing, also known as the dead zone, is a large oval shaped space in the middle of the forest. Trees seem to refuse to grow in this one area. No one knows why. Very creepy looking. We'll have pictures of that as well. Soil samples taken from the area haven't been able to establish a reason for this phenomena. What makes Emil Bernia's UFO sighting in this area especially interesting is that he never profited from it in any way. Not only did he have nothing to gain from reporting a UFO in this area, he actually had a lot to lose. Romania was a communist nation at the time, and his communist government equated belief in the paranormal with insanity. Mm. Barnia lost his job over reporting this sighting. And in Romania at that time, very hard to find a new job. Oh, uh, sure. Many UFO sightings followed, as have sightings of so many other types of paranormal activity. Many of those who have ventured into the forest over the past few decades have returned with strange tales of seeing balls of light, ghostly apparitions, they've heard voices growls and giggling they've come back with burns and rashes can't figure out how they've gotten them suddenly occurring negative psychological effects have also been reported many people claim to be overcome with anxiety upon entering the forest this also can manifest in illness including nausea vomiting headaches rashes still others claim to actually have been physically attacked within hoyabachu by unseen forces there are accounts of being scratched bitten pushed even thrown to the ground Now that we have a little lay of the land, let's examine one of these creepy mysteries, a very recent one. The following is one woman's account of what supposedly happened in Hoyabachu in 2016. Time now for a tale I'm calling The Beasts of the Clearing. Roxana had moved to Kluge in 2013, moving there to live with her girlfriend, Krina. One night a few years later, the two women started talking about all the spooky stuff they'd heard happening in Hoyabachu. Krina said she'd worked with some people who had claimed to have experienced some pretty scary phenomenon in the woods, people who had no memory of losing large chunks of time accompanied by no memory of how they'd also gotten scratches and bruises. One person she knew said she'd heard voices. Another thought he'd seen a UFO. Roxana, a true skeptic, had a hard time believing any of these tales. But the sheer volume of supposed paranormal encounters did pique her curiosity. Roxanne had long been a casual fan of all things paranormal, and she thought that she would love to experience concrete proof that something existed that lies outside the current worlds of uh, science, you know, explanation and understanding. 
So she's uh, so she proposed that she and Karina spend a night camping in the center of Hoyabachu. That's a terrible fucking idea. She wanted to camp in the clearing. Uh uh-uh. uh. And Karina, being a curious and adventurous person, agreed to go along despite the thought of staying in those haunted woods overnight, truly terrifying her. Late on a Monday summer afternoon, the two of them drove to a parking area nearby, left their truck, walked into the eerie looking forest of unnaturally twisted trees. They'd each use some vacation time to take that Monday and Tuesday off, choosing to stay on a Monday night, thinking that's when the two of them would be most alone in the woods. The short walk to the clearing was relatively uneventful. They quietly set up their tent. When it began to get dark, they did not make a campfire. They didn't even have permission to spend the night and were technically trespassing. When night finally came, they set up a few dim lanterns, giving off just enough light for the two to see each other and be able to see what they were doing when it came to opening beer bottles and grabbing some snacks. As the evening wore on, the woods around them grew silent. Then finally, around 1 a.m., they both heard the sound of a branch snapping in the distance. A big branch. The snapping was followed by a quick, loud, and high-pitched yelp. The yelp echoed through the trees in a dizzying way. Roxana immediately stopped chewing her pufaletti, a Romanian corn puff snack, and Krina stopped drinking her beer. Both women sat in the little fold-out chairs they'd packed and tried not to make any noise. Seconds went by, neither hearing anything as they listened intently. Seconds soon turned to minutes. After what may have been only five minutes but could have easily been fifteen, Roxana turned on a flashlight she'd brought and quickly scanned the trees around them, the strange, twisted trees. Nothing. She stood up and scanned the clearing all around them. Still nothing. Chalking the sounds up to some random woodland creature that apparently wasn't all that active, Krina went back to drinking her beer, and Roxana packed up her snack. She'd lost her appetite. Both women weren't outright scared, but they were definitely both spooked. Just after Roxana popped the lid off a beer bottle, Krina motioned for her to be quiet, whispering, Listen, listen, do you hear that? Roxana didn't hear anything, not at first, but then she slowly started picking up the noise of something moving out in the woods. When she first heard it, the movement sounded like it wasn't coming from behind her, then it seemed to move around over to the right of where she was facing, then it was behind her, then it was in front of her. Behind Krina, over to her left, she quickly realized something seemed to be circling her and Krina. Oh God. Something that moved through the woods faster than a human could. She turned her flashlight back on and when she was trying to shine it in the direction of whatever the hell was still moving, she could hear the occasional snap of a branch, the rustle of leaves. She ended up shining it near enough to Krina's face to see how afraid she was, and Krina's visible fear terrified Roxana. Krina was not the type to scare easily, almost never got scared, in fact. She didn't jump during horror movies, she didn't startle easily or flinch when she heard sudden, loud sounds, but right now, Krina was crying. Her lip was trembling, her eyes were darting wildly around her in all directions, she was freaking out. Her head was snapping back and forth as she tried to see where the still moving sounds were coming from. She looked like she was about to have a full-on nervous breakdown. She was now holding the flashlight as well. Then, behind Roxana, she saw some sort of humanoid shape dart Uh. out from behind one of the trees, then quickly disappear behind another at the edge of the clearing. She screamed. Roxana screamed as well and spun around as Krina started to yell, Go away! Go away! The sounds of whatever the hell this thing was were now moving towards Roxana's left. They both tried to track it with their flashlights and occasionally one of them would catch a glimpse of something human sized and human shaped but not human. Something gray, something so fast. Whenever they'd see it, both women would scream out. Then they heard more noises coming from a different edge of the clearing. It seemed as if there were two of these things now. Then they heard that strange yelping sound again. It seemed to come from one of these things. Soon they heard more yelps from all around them. How many of these things were there? Roxana took her phone out and started to record a video of what they were hearing and seeing. And then shortly after hitting record, the noises stopped. All Roxana and Krina could hear for the next 30 seconds or a minute were the sounds they were making. The sounds of their own scared, rushed breathing. Suddenly, while they were both scanning the same edge of the clearing, they heard something running up quickly behind them. Fuck. Roxanne and Karina would each later remember spinning around to see what was approaching. They would each later remember witnessing something, something humanish but not human. They would each also later remember feeling very afraid. And the next thing they'd both remember was waking up inside the tent the following morning, just after sunrise with a dull headache. What? How? How did they get inside their tent? What was circling them in the clearing? What had ran towards them? What had it done to them? Neither felt injured. When Roxana checked her phone to watch the video she'd taken, didn't reveal anything other than her and Krina being really, really scared. You could hear Krina crying, but you couldn't hear any of the yelps. You could hear Roxana scream, leave us alone. But you couldn't hear the sounds of movement in the forest. You definitely didn't see anything unusual. 
At one point, the phone spins around and then falls to the ground. Then it records nothing but normal forest sounds for over three minutes. Then it moves slightly and ends like it would as if someone or something were to pick it up and quickly turn it off. No evidence. Just another mystery added to the world's most mysterious forest. Roxana said that she and Karina packed up their things as quickly as they could, left the woods without further incident. Both agreed never to return to Hoya Bachu. Yeah, GTFO. Now check out these pictures. I don't know. I'm already super creeped this out by this. This is a weird, weird looking forest. Okay. This first uh, picture is the trees. I think it's kind of pretty. It, it is pretty. <laughs> But just it just adds to it. Uh, this is another. Just somebody put like a little skeleton costume up in the tree for this next picture. <laughs> Adding Stupid. to the little forest. Uh, this is Emil Barnia's photo of that UFO, the guy who got in trouble with the Romanian government. Oh, yeah, that's what he claimed was the thing he saw. I mean, what in the world is that? I mean, people. I'm sure that, some people are going to say it's Photoshop. Some people are not. I mean, that's what, is what it? I think of when I think UFO. Really? Like, that's absolutely. If you came home with that picture on your cell phone, yeah. I'd be like, yeah, yeah. aliens. Uh, this is a picture of the clearing. This is that little clearing that's just that one spot, you know, in the fort in the middle. How weird. You can see an aerial view in this next photo to give, like, it's some shape. Uh, yeah, just a weird, oh, right, in, right in the middle. The soil composition different, something they don't know. If you didn't, if I didn't know better, yeah. and you didn't explain it to me, I would think that that was a dried up lake. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, just like mm -hmm. some sort of reservoir kind of looking thing. And then one last picture of the woods. Just these weird bent trees. There were some other pictures that they were a little more bent, but they weren't good uh, quality photos. Quality? Yeah. Yeah, that is. I've never seen trees grow like that. Yeah, we we spend enough time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we go hiking. Like, we're mm -hmm. out in various places. Obviously, yeah. not now. Uh, but, yeah. uh, hmm. Interesting. I just thought it was fun to kind of like go to uh, a place we hadn't gone before on the show. Mm -hmm. We hadn't been to Transylvania, which is uh, such a classic horror place, of course, because the le the legends of Dracula, mm -hmm. you know, the Strigoi uh, coming out of there. So, yeah, I'd never heard. I was just, you know, messing around on the Internet, trying to bounce from kind of one topic to another, looking for something new. Right. And then came across this Hoya Bachu, and I was like, what? Never heard of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, somewhat touristy uh, during the day. I mean, it is in that area pretty well known. Okay. Well, when you were starting to tell it, I was like, hmm, I would absolutely never camp there. Absolutely never. Mm -hmm. Just from the beginning when you were listing off and then this could happen and this could happen and then this might have happened and then mm -hmm. this and that. There's too much. I wouldn't even want to visit during the day. Oh, I would. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting place. Dude, I don't think so. I'd want to see what kind of see what kind of energy I felt there. But it doesn't sound like anything would happen during the day. Maybe I want to stay there at night. Maybe you're staying by yourself. <laughs> Uh, any, any other questions on that one? No, no, I just, you know, I, I do have this like very real fear of aliens. And, uh, so, you yeah. know, the humanoid thing, I, I just don't know. Oh, well, I did want to ask you actually. So when was this? I, I, did you say like when this happened? Uh, j it just said recently. It didn't recently. have a date assigned, you know, it's, uh, yeah, just a random story. Uh, I wanna, first hand account on the web type of thing. I want to know where these girls are now. Like, are they Okay. Did they right. did they suffer any psych long term psychological damages? Mm -hmm. Like what's mm -hmm. happening now? Who knows? Who knows? Tell uh, them to send us an update. I like I like I don't know. There's a way to con. I guess you <laughs> I could know. post on the forum or whatever. But yeah, I like I like that, I like that there's mystery. This next one is uh, that one is just you know like obviously there's lots of different websites where people can post their encounters and, mm -hmm. you, and you can you know find these stories. The next one we're going to be telling today is. Uh, the most heavily documented or the most infamous, maybe I should say, uh, alien abduction story. Yee. Lots and lots and lots and lots of information, books, all kinds oh, of stuff about buddy. this one. That just gave me chills. <laughs> uh, very well known. Also very controversial. I mean, definitely like many skeptics consider it to be debunked. Uh, many uh, ufologists consider it to be one of the most important claimed abduction stories in all of ufology. Okay. So, I you feel, know, there's a big, the big divide on this one. I feel like it's been a while since we've had a good alien abduction this is this is like this is like the classic one. This is the one uh, in America that, after this one, uh, basically like any other one you would find as far as like ufology lore of like a, a well detailed abduction story happened after this one. Oh, okay. Yeah, Betty and Barney Hill, very classic story. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that lady in Australia? We talked yes. about many, many episodes ago. I think it was in the very first episode. Oh, I don't remember when it was, but mm -hmm. I still think about her sometimes. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, this is now you're gonna be now you're gonna replace those thoughts with this one. Great. I'm so excited, Dan. <laughs> no setup. You ready to dive in? Okay. Time now for the tale of the alien abductions of Barney and Betty Hill. Is it following us? That was the thought that raced through Barney and Betty Hill's minds as Barney drove through the rural, unlit, and winding roads of New Hampshire's White Mountains on the night of September 19th, 1961. Is it following us? Barney gunned it. The speedometer ticked from 60 to 70, 80 to 90. Usually his wife, Betty, would tell him not to go so fast. He commuted 60 miles to work and back every day and had a penchant for speeding, a habit she tried to break him of. But this was different. Betty knew they had to keep going. Is it following us? The Hills were returning from a trip, a delayed honeymoon of sorts. They'd only been married for 18 months. Barney was a postal worker in Boston, and Betty, born Elizabeth Eunice, or Eunice, was a social worker for the area around Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where she and Barney lived. Their decision to take a road trip had been spontaneous. Nearly the entire time they'd been married, Barney worked an hour away, Betty worked overtime to handle her enormous caseload, and then in mid-September 1961, the two left Portsmouth for Montreal. They drove through Montreal and Niagara Falls, where they spent the weekend, and after three days of needed vacation time, they returned home. On the last night of their trip, the tired but very happy couple had sipped coffee in a Vermont diner to recharge before driving back. Barney figured if they pushed through, they could beat the wind and rain from an approaching hurricane. They left the diner around 10 p.m., estimating they could reach their red-framed house in Portsmouth by 3 a.m. at the latest, and then not long into their trip, they both started to notice a strange light in the sky. They thought it was following them. At first, the light looked like a falling star, but it was growing larger and brighter and less meteorite-like with each mile. Despite the winding road changing directions often, despite dipping into valleys and driving around one ridge after another, this light followed them. Barney tried to assure his wife that there was nothing to worry about. It's just a satellite, he said to Betty. Probably went a little off course. But Betty thought he seemed unsure of what he was saying, and then she watched him press a little more firmly on the gas. She knew he was bothered by the light as much as she was. The light seemed to move along with the car as Barney steered down the mountain road. Betty held her breath as they rounded another curve, the tires now squealing as they barreled past the edge of a cliff. Still, the light followed. It zigged and zagged, ducking past the moon and behind trees and mountain ridges, only to reappear moments later. Sometimes it seemed to move towards them, and then a few minutes later, seemed to drift away. It would come back. It would always come back. Had to be an illusion, they thought. Maybe the car's movement made it seem like the light, too, was moving. The night was too quiet for a helicopter, a commercial plane, or even a military jet. Is it following us? The couple's dog whined in the back seat, and Barney pulled into a rest stop to, uh, so they could take the terrier out to pee. They had traveled about 70 miles from the diner in Vermont now. As they waited by the picnic tables, Betty took out a pair of binoculars they brought along for the weekend. Peering through them, Betty saw that the white light was actually an object spinning in the air. Barney, she said, lowering her binoculars. If you think that's a satellite or a star, you're being completely ridiculous. As they stared at the object, Barney's hand moved to the pistol he carried on his belt. Then before he could grab it, a cold wave passed over him and he realized he was paralyzed. Then as though it wasn't his own thought, but someone else's voice inside his head, he heard clearly, stay where you are. Ugh. Breaking free from the paralysis a moment later, Barney ran back to the car and shouted for Betty to get inside. He shouted, they're going to capture us. Once the, uh, the two of them and the Terrier were inside, he gunned the engine, peeled out of the parking lot. By the time they were back on the highway, without explanation, loud rhythmic beeps could be heard now emanating from the trunk. They both began to panic. Their dog whined and shook. They kept driving as this still-following-them object rapidly descended towards their car, then moved a short distance ahead of them, lowered enough to entirely block the highway. What? Barney slammed on his brakes. In the middle of the highway in front of them, the huge silent craft moved backwards towards them and now hovered above the hill's car. It was large enough to fill the entire field of view outside the windshield. Barney got out of the car and saw somewhere between 8 and 11 humanoid figures peering out of the craft's windows, seeming to look at them. Oh my god. He later recalled them wearing glossy black uniforms and black hats. In unison, all but one figure moved to what appeared to be a panel on the rear wall of the hallway and encircled the front portion of the craft. Red lights on what appeared to be bat-wing fins began to telescope out of the sides of the craft and a long structure descended from the bottom. While Betty looked at the craft from the car, Barney, in a complete state of shock now, tried to run. And then everything went black for both of them. When they woke up, they were driving down the road, only a few minutes from their house in Portsmouth. How? They didn't feel relieved. They felt dirty. They felt confused and violated. 
Their watches had stopped working, both set to a time just after 3 a.m. Barney's shoes were scuffed, Betty's dress was ripped. The leather sta- strap of their binoculars was broken, Betty would lost her handbag. There were also shiny, concentric circles imprinted on their car's trunk that had not been there the previous day. What does that mean? Something had happened, but they didn't know what. Not able to come up with any answers, the Hills initially kept quiet about the whole thing. The two were well regarded in their community, and they didn't want to damage their reputations. Both were active in the local chapter of the NAACP. Barney had received multiple commendations for his work with the civil rights movement, including being honored for his outstanding service to the community by the governor of New Hampshire. He was even invited to the inauguration of Lyndon Johnson in 1963. Damn, that's awesome. As an interracial couple during a time when that was exceedingly rare in the U.S., Betty was white and Barney was black, one could argue that risking being viewed as UFO nuts would not have uh, not be anything either one of them would have z- any interest in whatsoever. Sure, sure. They tried their best to get back to their normal lives for the first two days. They were home. Betty went on juggling her enormous caseload while Barney made the daily trek back and forth to Boston. But something had changed. They felt different. They now felt the presence of something strange in their lives, something new, something related to what they'd witnessed. Nothing solid or menacing exactly, but something. Barney now often felt phantom touches along his body's lower half. Betty became disoriented easily. On September 1st, Betty telephoned uh, Peace Air Force Base to report that strange things that had happened to them, even though she couldn't remember all the details. On September 22nd, Major Paul W. Henderson telephoned the Hills for a more detailed interview. Henderson's initial report, dated September 26, determined that the Hills had probably just misidentified the planet Jupiter. But in a later report, he changed the wording of the Hill statement to use terms like optical condition, inversion, and insufficient data. And then this report was forwarded to Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book was part of a series of studies of unidentified flying objects conducted by the United States Air Force ran from 1952 until 1969. During that time, collected over 12,000 reports of UFO sightings. Shut up. And even though many of these sightings could quickly be explained away as being secret reconnaissance planes, weather balloons, things definitely of this world, researchers estimate that somewhere between 2 and 5% of the reports have never been explained, even after decades of analysis. Oh my gosh. Meanwhile, strange encounters after effects continue at the Hill home, or strange encounter after effects continue at the Hill home, Ten days after the encounter, Betty has a series of vivid dreams. They continue for five successive nights. Never in her memory had she recalled dreams in such detail and intensity. And they never, and then they stopped abruptly after five nights and then never returned. Hmm. In one dream, she and Barney encountered a roadblock and men surrounded their car. She lost consciousness but struggled to regain it. She then realized that she was being forced by two small men to walk into a forest at night. Barney was walking behind her, that when she called to him, he seemed to be in a trance or sleepwalking. The men stood about five feet to five feet four inches tall, wore matching blue uniforms with caps similar to those worn by military cadets. They appeared nearly human, with black hair, dark eyes, prominent noses, and bluish lips. Their skin was a grayish color. Barney began to have health problems. He developed an ulcer and had an exi- uh, and, and developed an anxiety disorder. Within months of the initial incident, the Hills saw two doctors and were finally referred to Dr. Benjamin Simon, a Boston psychiatrist who specialized in hypnotherapy. Dr. Simon put the Hills under using hypnosis. He hypnotized them separately so that neither would know what the other said. As Barney slipped under, his face went slack, his eyes shut, and he seemed to fall into a light sleep. And then his eyes opened and he looked frantic and scared. He looked straight ahead of him as though seen right through Dr. Simon and said in a quavering voice, I don't, I don't want to be operated on. What? And then he told Dr. Simon a story. Barney told Dr. Simon that the binocular strap had broken when he ran from the UFO ramp back to his car. He recalled driving the car away from the UFO, but that afterwards he felt irresistibly compelled to pull off the road and drive into the woods. He eventually sighted six men standing in a dirt road. The car stalled. Three of the men approached the car. They told Barney to not fear them. The leader told Barney to close his eyes. In Dr. Simon's office, Barney said, I I felt like the eyes had pushed into my eyes. It seemed that the eyes were what frightened Barney the most. He just couldn't get them out of his head. In a different session, he said, all I see are those eyes. I'm not even afraid that they're not connected to a body. They're just there. They're just up close to me, pressing against my eyes. Barney and Betty were taken into the disshaped craft where they were separated and assigned to sit in different rooms. On the opposite wall of her room, Betty saw a map of the galaxy. 
The walls were curved and a large light hung from the ceiling in Barney's room. The table was so short that his feet touched the floor. And then the beans began to examine them. The beans removed Betty and Barney's clothes, plucked strands of their hair, took clippings of their nails, scraped their skin. Ugh. Each sample was placed on a clear material like a glass slide. But when Betty touched it, the material didn't feel like glass or plastic. It was much more malleable. The beans inserted needles connected to long wires into Betty and Barney's heads, arms, legs, spines. One large needle around four to six inches long was inserted into Betty's belly. My God. It left her writhing in pain. A cup-like device was placed over Barney's genitals. <gasps> he did not experience an orgasm, but he thought that somehow a sperm sample had been collected from him. The men scraped his skin, peered into his ears and mouth. The thin tube or cylinder was inserted into his anus and quickly removed. Huh. Someone standing behind him felt his spine and seemed to be counting his vertebrae. Throughout a bean, Barney and Betty called the leader watched from the side, and then eventually the beans all left. Barney and Betty were escorted back to their car. In a daze, Barney watched the ship leave. He then saw a light in the road and mumbled, No, not again. Betty speculated that it might have been the moon, but the moon had set, had set several hours ago. The pair drove home, didn't fully regain consciousness until hours later. In the decades following her original 1961 experience with her husband Barney, Betty would go on to claim not a few, not dozens, but hundreds of additional UFO sightings. Oh boy. Did the beans come back for her? Had they found something in the test they ran that made her a good candidate for continued study? The story leaked to the press, captured the nation's imagination. Prior to the Hills' experience, most alien encounter stories had been friendly. The Hills' story was invasive and terrifying. Their experience was painful and confusing. Betty became a known voice in UFO research. The publicity she received from her abduction made her internationally famous, but she never tried to capitalize on that fame. She just wanted answers. She continued to research into UFOs for the remainder of her life, even after Barney's sudden death. He died of a cerebral hemorrhage on February 25th, 1969. Hmm. Betty would outlive her husband by over 35 years, not dying herself until October 17th, 2004. Did they make it all up? Was it all false memories created via hypnosis, perhaps? Or maybe beings from another world view us as nothing more than lab rats, that they can study and they can do whatever they wish at whatever time they want. <sighs> that is my worst nightmare of aliens lined out, line by line, word by word. That's what I think would happen. That's, a, that's what I think would happen. They would examine you? Yes, what do they want? I mean, if it's real, I mean, who knows? I mean, we study animals. We could be animals, you know, to, no. some, to some other race. No but, different than like a, a cow is to the human race or, you know, a goat, the, some other race of creatures if they exist, which I but, think it, they probably do, but could cows, view us the same way. Cows make delicious hamburgers. Maybe we make delicious hamburgers. No, no. <laughs> oh, God. But it, it just sounds like something we would do. Like, hey, let's like hop in the car and, and go for a little drive. Right. Get out of Dodge for a couple of days. Stop at a diner. That's mm. totally us. We'd push on through like, oh, I just want to get home to our bed. Oh, let's yeah. Go. A lot of people. Yeah. Well, you know, we're supposed to do like a cross country road trip next summer. And mm -hmm. that story makes me feel very unsure about that. <laughs> I hope, I hope they find us. No nighttime driving. That'd, oh, be, they, that'd be the best cross-country road trip ever is if we ended up in a spaceship. If they find all four of us and our doodles? Yeah. What if But what if they put a little tube in little Ginger's butt? I don't know. Maybe she'll like it. <laughs> God, I hate you. Uh, let's see some pictures of this. This is a picture of young Betty and Barney Hill. Okay. Aw, such mm -hmm. a cute couple. Uh, here's another picture of them. Another picture of the of the couple. Cute. I think that one is shortly before he, he passed away, I think. Uh, I, I quite like that wallpaper. <laughs> uh, this is an image of aliens based on Barney's memories that were induced via hypnosis. This is what he thinks he's, or, you know, he thought he saw. I know. And like what he describes almost feels like humans that were removed from Earth. Mm -hmm. They don't There's feel. There's so many theories. Well, they don't feel as like, um, like the weird ovally shaped head mm -hmm. and the long goobly fingers <laughs> mm -hmm. they yeah. felt more human-esque yeah we could go into a whole wormhole about that stuff where some people believe that uh you know that ufo sightings are real but they're mm -hmm. not from another planet they're actually future humans coming back to study past humans oh i never heard of that i thought you're a lot of different theories yeah. i thought you were gonna say something to the effect of like some people think that the government mm -hmm. has you know some special uh little plan going on where they mm. breed humans that are not quite human and those humans watch us. Mm. 
You know, I don't know why I think that. You know what the end of that plan is? There's like on the final page of that plan, there's huh. just a diagram of how to stick a little uh, device up an Australian Labradoodle's butt. So that's the final chapter of that plan. Um, this is uh, this is last one last image. This is based on one of Barney's memories the night he saw the aliens. You're the worst. This is the last. What is that? Look at it. I don't want to. Was that your face on a dog? <laughs> no. Why do you think that's my face? It looks nothing like me. I don't want to look. I just saw it in like a little bit. That's a still for. <laughs> what is that? I just that? thought that was ridiculous. It came up when I was searching, and it was the most disturbing photo. It's actually from a, a 1978 remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I never saw it. It's just a, it's a little, little. I don't know. Some dude's face got stuck on a dog. <laughs> I just thought you did like some really poor photoshopping. <laughs> I just love how you thought like that guy's face could I, be I didn't my see, face. You know, I, did, oh, I looked okay. this much. I went like this. And oh, went like okay. this. I saw a former bearded face. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I thought, heek. So those are my stories. Little little uh, missing time theme we went with today. I don't, <sighs> I don't want to theme every episode, but I, but I like doing it Well, I mean, you can if you want to, if that's your jam. So that's, yeah, no, just. What do you sometimes. think about aliens, Dan? Oh, I totally believe in aliens. But what what version of aliens do you believe in? I just I just I just think numbers wise. Uh, I mean, there's there's it's infinite. The universe theoretically is infinite. An infinite number of planets, and then mathematically, there have to be some that, that you know also uh, possess the right ingredients for life. Mm -hmm. And out of those, if it's infinite, there's got to be. I mean, kind of theoretically, if it just never stops expanding, there's an infinite number of those. Mm -hmm. And if there's so many different worlds out there that have the right kind of uh, ingredients to have life, then I would guess that you know statistically, some of those planets would be behind us evolutionary mm -hmm. wise, mm -hmm. and some would be ahead of us. And some of the ones that are ahead of us, well, that's fucking how Star Trek gets here. Do you think they're doing like a little podcast about how dumb the people on Earth are? God, if you really want to go down that rabbit hole of like the multiverse and everything like that, then yeah, there's uh, there's tons of other people doing podcasts and tons of other worlds. Well, they're probably doing something aliens. more elevated than podcasts. Starts, it starts to make my brain hurt after a while. <laughs> but but yeah, but I but I just think that um, yes, I I think there are other forms of life out in the galaxy, and I think odds are probably they visited us. And now, I don't think every claim is real. Right. I think many people's claims are nonsense or they mm -hmm. just, you know, got something wrong and they saw something in the sky that they didn't understand could be a satellite mm -hmm. and they're convinced they saw aliens. Um, but I mean, I, I think that some of the claims are real. I totally believe in aliens. And okay. And again, so when you say alien, so in an, an intelligent uh, being? Intelligent being. I believe in a, 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 a multitude of different alien races. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. Well, let's just leave it there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, some of them probably, yeah, probably, probably want to do a lot of butt stuff to, you know. <laughs> Stop it. To Polish, Polish ladies. Hey, yeah. There's got to be, I mean, if you go with the infinite type stuff, there's there is probably an alien spaceship that is circling somewhere in the galaxy right now. And ideally, they want to find a Polish woman and two doodles, and they want to shove so much stuff up their asses. <laughs> <laughs> they have like a, <laughs> they have a mission log, and that's mostly what it revolves around. How is this my life? <laughs> I don't know. Listening to you spout weird philosophies <laughs> and theories about me getting things shoved up my ass. I don't know. <laughs> Listen, don't Stash. Know. <laughs> uh, how come you're never getting things shoved up your ass? Why aren't you on the log of things to do? I probably am. There's another spaceship floating around looking for me. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. Crystals up your ass. That's their plan. <laughs> Sweet. Big, juicy crystals. We have to bring the dogs in for an episode. I think the yeah, ginger, point. Penny would be terrible. Eventually she'd be annoyed. She'd run around. We'll bring them in to the end of an episode. I don't, I, think, I don't think they need to sit for a whole episode. I think ginger would be happy to sit here and snuggle mom for a whole okay, episode. She might. she might. What do you guys think? But if she if she messes up the show, I'll, I'll kill her. Hey, yeah. I'll put her down. Stop it. In the middle, mid podcast. You would be hysterical. I would be. I'd be so sad. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to be the one who's going to have to pick you up off the ground when we have to put our dogs down. Don't even talk about that. See? Exactly. You can't even handle it. I know. If I talk about it enough, you'll just start to cry. Stop. Do you guys want to see Dan? No, cry? what are you doing? Just read your stories. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I didn't even plan this, but I'm wearing this awesome mm -hmm. Ohio shirt. So fun. Cool this, retro Buckeye shirt. I, it's really, there's this company based in Ohio called Homage, H O M A G E. Mm -hmm. They do really cool, it's all Ohio stuff, actually. Awesome. Kate and Logan told me about it. Um, so it's great because this first story is in Ohio. Okay. I'm okay. Ready. Are ready. you ready? Yes. Um, so this is a possible haunting and I, I will be absolutely surprised if it doesn't scare the bejeebas out of you. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Hey, Dan and Lindsay, I found your podcast recently and I am obsessed with it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's been a week and I've listened to every episode. Oh, shit. All right. You love got... Creeper. Who? Mm, yeah. Nice creep. Nice creep. Horror junkie. Probably not. I always want to say, I, say, I know it's Creep and Peeper, but I always want to put the er on the creep too. Creeper Peeper? I think it's AKA Creep, AKA Creeper. It could be either or. Peep, AKA Peeper, AKA Scaredy Cat. I don't know. Okay. So continuing. I don't usually write fan mail or anything like that, but I do have a story that I've never told before to anyone because enough people already think I'm weird. <laughs> I get it. Fair. But where else to tell your story than the My Story segment? It might be a bit long-winded, so sorry if it's a long read. I've always believed in ghosts, and I've had my fair share of experiences growing up. As a kid, though, all of those experiences were good, other than the unhealthy amounts of horror films I watched growing up, I'd never experienced anything terrifying or evil. However, that changed about four years ago. That sto- This story isn't all bad, but to this day, sleep doesn't come easy. Whoa. When I was 18, my parents kicked me out of the house. Being very devout Catholics, they weren't privy to the idea of me dating anyone outside the church. Mm-hmm. Totally get it. I told them that I had been hanging out with this girl from work and my mom just lost it. That day, my stuff was in the car and I left without even saying goodbye to my siblings. To make a very, very long story short, I moved in with my girlfriend. My girlfriend and now fiance lived in an apartment building about 40 minutes from my parents' house in the middle of Cornfield Land, Ohio. Ohio. (laughs) The apartment had apparently been used as a barn for several generations before the current landlords inherited it and turned it into living spaces. It was strange, but charming in its own sense. Yeah. The first few months were okay, maybe a little depressing as I got more and more homesick, but overall nothing to write home about. Mm -hmm. One night, when I got home from a closing shift at work, a man was sitting on the stoop in front of a neighbor's apartment. Though it was strange for anyone to be outside that late, I didn't think much of it. He said hello, I said hello, and I went inside. I didn't recognize him as a tenant, and I asked my girlfriend if she met the new neighbors. Mm -hmm. She casually said, oh, no, that's the man on the the stoop. He doesn't actually live here. Confused, I asked for clarification, thinking we had a hobo situation or something. (laughs) She said, he's a ghost. I laughed it off, thinking she was kidding. She was definitely not kidding. She told me she'd seen the stoop guy many, many times when it was dark and nobody else was outside. And we kept seeing him until we moved out of there. However, the stoop guy wasn't the only thing that didn't belong there. While there had always been little things that we could explain away, like the faucets turning on by themselves or the doors closing on their own or things uh, getting a little weird. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And things started getting a little bit more weird after eight months after I moved in. One time I got home while my girlfriend was still at work and all of the lights were on. This was totally not something my girlfriend would do since she was still a single woman in survival mode and did everything she could to keep the electric bill down. Not only that, but there was a tub of peanut butter open on the kitchen floor and the walls and the doors and the ceiling. Peanut butter was smeared on almost every surface in the kitchen. I called my girlfriend at work and she didn't believe me. I wish I'd taken pictures, but I wasn't worried Uh, But I was more worried about someone being in the apartment, even though they weren't. I cleaned it up, and I went to Best Buy to buy some nanny cameras. I set one up in the kitchen and one in the living room. They only went off when movement was captured, and we never caught anything on them. While the little things kept happening here and there, we still didn't feel very scared or even threatened. Nothing had done anything to harm either of us or even make us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. All the way up to us moving out, my girlfriend had never had one bad experience with anything paranormal in that place. I wish I could say the same. Mm -hmm. I started having the strangest dreams. In these dreams, I would be in the woods behind the apartments playing with a little boy. We would kick around a ball and chase each other through the trees, play hide and go seek and other things that you would do with a child. The thing I found the weirdest, though, was that these dreams were incredibly vivid and also only in sepia tone. You know, like the black and whites, but brown version of that. Every detail stuck with me long after I would wake up. And they occurred every night for months, but each night a little different from the night before. After a few months, I noticed the dream started to get weird. Some nights I would count to ten cover my eyes and look for my friend for hours and hours until I woke up more stressed, more exhausted and stressed out than when I had gone to bed. Mm -hmm. Eventually I would be all by myself in the woods and I stopped trying to play hide and go seek and other games with him altogether. 
Eventually, these dreams stopped occurring, and I pretty much forgot about it. A few more months with, went by with the normal level of small things happening until everything came to a head one night. I went to bed late after working on a school project until about 2 a.m. Looking back on it now, I don't even remember going to bed or falling asleep, which was a little strange in hindsight. When I woke up, it was just after 3.30 a.m., and I looked around wondering what woke me. Mm -hmm. The first thing I noticed was that, was that the light was on in the hallway outside the bedroom. We don't ever leave these lights on. But then I saw the little boy. He was sitting in the fetal position under the light switch in the bedroom. He was crying, what? and through a thick, nasally sob, he was repeating over and over, He got in. I tried to stop him, but he got in. What, is this not a dream now? Thinking this was just another strange dream, okay. I tried consoling the kid and asked him where he'd been. I told him I missed playing ball with him every night and that I never got to know his name. He ignored me and kept sobbing and repeating himself. Then I noticed something else. I was lying in the middle of the bed on my back with my arms stretched out to make a T shape. My head was hanging off the bed, drooping down, exposing my neck. The worst part, however, was I couldn't move. I don't know if it was sleep paralysis, but I could not feel weight on my chest, but my wrists and my ankles were tied down. It, it felt like I was tied down. Starting to panic, I tried relentlessly to move, to break out, all while asking my little friend to help me. He just kept sobbing, talking, and rocking back and forth, but didn't seem to hear me. At this point, I had been keeping my eyes on the little boy trying so hard to get his attention. I was screaming at this point, but my girlfriend didn't even stir. Then, the little boy stopped crying and shouted, Look! I was able to then move slowly. I moved my head in the direction the boy was pointing, and I saw a pair of legs. They were bowed out, short and stumpy. I screamed again, not, but yet not able to get anyone's attention. I just screamed in pure fear. I felt like something was slowly drug across my neck, like someone or something was teasing me. I screamed more because there was nothing else I could do, and I looked to the little boy again. He wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. I tried to move again to tilt my head to see more of the legs, but I couldn't. I screamed one more time and then I shot upright. Finally, my girlfriend woke up and was totally freaked out because she thought I was being murdered. I tried explaining what happened, but my vocal cords were completely fried and I couldn't even talk. Maybe I was actually screaming the whole time. I don't know. I'm not ashamed to admit that as an adult, I had wet the bed. I was wow. so upset that my girlfriend put me in the car and we drove around for hours before winding up at a Denny's. We always went there if one of us was having a rough time, so maybe it was just out of habit. And even though I just went through the most terrifying thing I had ever experienced, I still couldn't pass up the opportunity to smash a giant stack of pancakes. <laughs> the next day, while taking a shower, I was drying my beard and noticed a big, long, raised scratch across my throat. Uh. If my girlfriend didn't believe me before, she sure did now. We immediately went to this witchy store, which I usually took my girlfriend to to feed her crystal addiction, and bought some sage and a million crystals the lady at the counter recommended for hauntings, demonic entities, and negative energy. We saged the entire apartment and put crystals in little dishes throughout the house. I was still hesitant to sleep for weeks after that, but I never saw the little sepia boy or anything other than the stoop man ever again. Keep creeping and peeping. Love the show. Wow. So just uh, uh, the ghost and then a very strange, per very persistent series of nightmares that ended with actually like raised, like scratch, a raised scratch across his throat that matched the thing from the nightmare. I mean, yeah, it sounds like t the way I take it is stoop guy, yep. totally fine. But, but maybe that opens some sort of portal or maybe he's not fine. Right? Maybe Stoop Guy is like actually a really bad guy. Who knows? And then this this story yeah, writer little, yeah. has these dreams every night that start off totally normal, like just playing in the woods. I mean, graphic right. and Always vivid. Always the little boy. But then slowly but surely, the little boy is not there as much. The game go, or the games go too long. Little boy's gone. And then story writer, mm -hmm. in my opinion, sleep paralysis. Mm -hmm, but he mm -hmm. wakes up. Or sleep paralysis. I don't know. He doesn't know. And he's seeing this little boy in the corner and he's screaming, but like, it seems like he can't tell the difference. And then eventually, whether he was awake or not, I mean, could he have been awake and his girlfriend was, she was having sleep paralysis and didn't know it and couldn't hear him screaming? Like, it's so. Right, right. I don't know. I just feel like that place I've was never definitely. Had nightmares like that. I just feel like that place was definitely haunted by something. Mm hmm, mm hmm. Creepy. Creep tastic. Oh, it's always creepy, um, just the, the start of that one. I mean, yes, the nightmare 
uh, very creepy. But if it, if, it, if it was just a nightmare, I'd be like, oh, that's a that sucks. You had like those nightmares. The ending would be weird. Mm-hmm. But the part that actually creeped me out the most was just that beginning, just that kind of mention of the dude on the stoop. Mm-hmm. That uh, <laughs> that's that's always so creepy when like when you see like oh my god who is that guy and you're definitely seeing something and then somebody else when you haven't told them what you're just seeing they're like oh that's so and so. They, and, and it matches what you just saw, and then they're like, "That's not a person; that's a ghost." Like that's 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 the hardest to rationalize away, because mm-hmm. it's like you didn't corroborate that story, you know, like like you right, didn't, you didn't right. come up with that stoop guy together. You're seeing something that somebody else is claiming that they already saw, and then the way they said, I mean, that's the and, and there's a lot of examples of that. Sure, and they always just like ah, how do you rash, how do you reason that one away? Yeah, and then of course like. Water being turned on, doors being shut. Oh, right, shut, and then there's all those all details, those little too. Things. There mm-hmm. was definitely something going on in there. And I think... Infiltrated his mind or something? For possibly. And my take kind of on it is that whatever was there didn't like him. Because it sounds like nothing bad ever happened to his girlfriend when they were living there. So prior to him moving in yeah. with her, totally fine, other than the stoop guy. Yeah. So then he moves in, and then shit gets crazy, and only for him. And there's, and and that's that tends to be the case with most stories where you know, like 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 in a lot of stories of some kind of like let's say poltergeist activity, mm-hmm. there will be a variety of people who see something, see mm-hmm. some some unexplainable things, but almost without fail, one person gets the brunt of it. Yes. What like the, the, they the uh, they kind of upset mm-hmm. the apple cart in some capacity, or yeah. they attract it more, or yeah. yeah. Like, it's going to get you more than it's going to get me. Because I won't even be any fun. Like, I'll just give in so fast. You think something's going to get me more than you? Yeah. Hmm. I think, I mean, you're the one who talks about there might be something in our house. There is. So, maybe if there is, maybe it's like, maybe the reason I'm not seeing a lot of stuff is because I'm just like a... I think I think a lot of times, like, spirits, it's like based on your kind of, um, your energy. Like, if you have a pure... <laughs> like you have you, the least pure energy of if, anyone no, ever. No, no, no. If you have a really pure, wholesome energy and just, you're, do you see my just, aura you're just do you see good. my aura they don't go for you then if you have you know if you're like damaged then they come after you oh, I'm damaged. <laughs> yikes psychology 101 <laughs> rears its ugly I head i just wanted to throw a word out there <laughs> i didn't know it. no wait it for sure gets you before it gets me mm-hmm. you know why why Cause, because because me because previously yeah i was the one who was there the most i was talking to it the most i told it it was okay to be there but like we had to share the space it's happy with me because I kind of like entertain it. I interact mm. with it. And I was there. I was the most frequent interactive piece of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. And now you're kind of like there all the time and you weren't previously like you're the new element. It's just mm. kind of waiting to get you. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll talk about it as soon as it does. Okay, cool. Um, okay, this is like so bizarre. We're going to Missouri. We're okay. going into a possibly haunted cave that was I think almost definitely used for some kind of occult activity. Okay. It's such a bizarre story. So good. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to take a deep breath right in your guys' ears. My bad. <laughs> I uh, didn't. I, I thought I had a sneeze and a cough yeah. and nothing really happened. Okay, so here we go. Hey, I'm Luke. I wanted to share one of my most frightening experiences of my life. A little backstory prior to these events. Mm-hmm. Back when I was a kid, around my twelfth birthday, twelfth birthday, I was severely into researching religion and cults, as well as death and death-related things, trying to find an answer for why I went through losing my grandfather and understand be- death better. So I was about a fourteen-year-ish, fourteen-ish year old boy, rather versed in occult and religious symbols. Okay, which I totally get that. If you have lost somebody young, you really mm-hmm. are seeking out those answers. Mm-hmm. This is the most frightening time of my life. Around 14 years old, one of my friends and I, we'll call him John, found a cave that was man-made and it went for what we assumed was miles and miles back and underneath the town of Kearney, Missouri. We happened to cross this cave by complete mistake as we used to love to go exploring in the woods and find cool places to camp. Mm-hmm. Kearney, or Kearney? Kearney, was a quiet town. Is it K-E-A-R-N? E-Y? It is. Uh, in Nebraska, that's Kearney. So it might still be Kearney in Missouri. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. I thought you were being silly. No, I was being serious. Well, I'm going to say Kearney. Okay. Because we're not in, we're in Kansas City. No, you're, mis- oh, you're in Kansas City. Near Kansas City. Or, uh, well, I, as I'm about to say, Kearney oh. was a quiet town, just an average rural area for the most part a- around the Kansas City area. Okay. Okay. Are you happy now? <laughs> you're ruining Luke's story. I'm, no, I'll be quiet. <laughs> 
One day, me and John decided we wanted to go explore the rock quarry that wasn't too far from his stepfather's home out near Petty Road. As we grew bored finding nothing of interest, we moved into the woods nearby heading south. As we got further into the woods, they were filled with tall oak trees. We saw at the face of this steep hill, a small hole, just big enough that we could climb into. John peeked in and asked for the flashlight we always had with us in our bag of tools. Typically, we had a bag of tools consisting of a machete for clearing brush or defending ourselves, a flashlight or two, food, drinks, and lighters in case we needed to start a fire. Mm -hmm. as, I handled, as I handed him the flashlight, he said something along the lines of, I'm going in, and this is where it gets strange. As we both go in and drag our bag through with us, we immediately felt uncomfortable, as if we knew something just wasn't right. As we moved back further into the cave, not stopping for easily 10 minutes, we heard the most terrifying sound of what sounded like a woman screaming for dear life. We both grabbed our machetes and flashlights and left the bag beside a pillar that was to the left to support that was that was left to support what I imagine was an old mine or something. Not totally mm -hmm. sure what this cave was. Being rather brave and or stupid, we took off running back further into the cave as brave as we could in hopes of saving someone's life. Okay. As we grew tired, running for what seemed like an eternity, chasing the screams that never seemed to sound closer to us, we started seeing strange old chairs and remnants of fires, but nothing else was really in there. We thought maybe people hung out in there or had parties or something. It, it wouldn't be that uncommon for town people to have field parties and whatnot in here. As we got further back into the cave system, we started seeing scratches along the pillars and cave walls, but thought very little of it until we saw some strange looking sigils of sorts that were definitely man-made. Unsure of what most of them were, I told John that I didn't like what we were into. We looked to be in a place where people practice occult things. I mm -hmm. immediately insisted on turning back, but then I noticed one of the sigils were that of Amad Os Osmodeus, the demon of lust. But John said he wanted to keep going back because we had our machetes and we would be just fine. Too scared to go back out by myself, I stayed with him and we kept walking further back into the cave. I'm not sure how far we made it into the cave, but a few minutes after I suggested we leave, we started hearing what definitely was not human footsteps. Unless they were wearing some wooden shoes, we heard them on the stone and rock and dirt flooring of the cave. We started frantically looking all over with our flashlights, but we saw nothing. We started to turn back and run for what could be we started to turn back and run for what could be saving our own lives. But as soon as we started to run, we both saw what seemed to be three figures, about eight feet in height, almost figureless clouds of black smoke with eyes that glowed a deep red. What the fuck? These weren't human shaped eyes. They felt more bestial, almost as if they were no form of warmth to them and as if they were looking for something to prey on. John decided, even though we were both screaming at the things with our machetes drawn, he was going to pick up a rock and throw it at them. As soon as the stone left his hand, they all vanish, as if they just dematerialized into the ceiling of the cave. Nearly frozen in fear, I managed to find my strength and grab John and started running with him in tow. Heading back to the entrance, running as fast and as hard as we could, John made it a few steps ahead of me, and then I watched him fall. There was nothing for him to even trip over. He didn't even lose his footing. It was like something had grabbed his leg and just abruptly stopped him in his tracks. I, I slid to a stop, helped my best friend up. He dropped his machete and his flashlight, but we did not go back for them. We just ran. The whole time we were running to the entrance, we heard voices accompanied by the pattering and pouncing of what seemed to be a hoofed creature what? or maybe human feet. Finally, we saw the light of the entrance, but no sooner than that, that it appeared. The best way I can describe it would be if a, if a, sat, a satyr, a, a satyr. satyr, thank you, and a werewolf were combined. The bottom half very deer-like, the top a wolf's head, but a human torso with hands that looked at like it could claw you in half. What the fuck? It ran on all fours, as most mammals do, but it also had a human-like stature when it became stationary. It could stare down on top of us, like a bear would stand up to try and catch a scent or a sight of something nearby. I leapt from behind a large cave pillar and slid to a stop in front of the gnashing teeth, stand 
sorry, it leapt from behind a large cave pillar and slid to a stop in front of us, gnashing its teeth, standing on all fours, circling us like a wolf would. As it circled us, one set of deep red eyes glared at me and then at John. Not a second later, two more sets of eyes behind the original set, deep red as well, showed up. Me and John, frozen in fear, finally broke loose and John said, get behind me. He starts moving towards it, rock in hand, machete in the other. It leaps behind a pillar, then to the next, and eventually stirs up a ton of dust, making it hard to see the light and of the cave entrance, but we both made a run for it. As we got closer to the entrance, all the sounds stopped. We couldn't even hear ourselves. It was as if we went deaf. John pointed at the cave and waved for me to go first, and as I got through, I then turned around and pulled him through right after. We both got up and ran about 100 yards before we completely collapsed. We both woke up later near sundown in the woods. We decided we were going to run home, no stopping, even though we were both extremely exhausted and sore from our adventure. Mm -hmm. We made it back, told his family, but they told us that it was just a bobcat or a coyote. We know what we saw that day. Our bag and our flashlight may still be in there to this day. Who knows? I won't go in there and I won't even go within a mile of that place anymore. John hasn't been right since that day. He fell heavy into drinking and is still haunted by the creature that is in his mind. Now, I'm a very firm atheist and a complete science nerd, and I can say we both saw the same thing that day. We have talked about it very little, even after it happened, but we both saw the exact creature. So what could it have been? Our minds playing tricks on us? I don't want to give too much credit to demons existing, but this creature was, by the way it moved, almost in defiance of gravity and not of this world. Even to this day, as I am nearly 30 years old, if I hear something move across the grass or in the woods at night, I nearly have a heart attack because my mind goes straight to that creature being wherever that noise came from. What the fuck was that? Exactly. My mind has been (laughs) stuck on that question for like the last five minutes. Just trying to, I, I just keep like putting myself in a situation where, oh my God, if I was in a cave, I mean, caves are creepy. We, I mean, I, anyway. I will not go in caves. Right, I, I won't do right, it. Right, right. I mean, caves just, you know, with like the, the bats and just um, the, uh, unusual rock formations with the stalactites and the stalagmites that you just wouldn't right. see, you know, like weird types of salamanders and Ugh, uh, different salamanders. things. salamanders. Just, just, it, it's just a different little ecosystem that we're, that we're used to encountering. Right. Like it's very different than like, um, you know, most kind of wilderness t- type places that you would go to. So inherent, I mean, it's dark, mm-hmm. you know, uh, there's so, and then if, to, to see something like that, I mean, it could be cave it could be it could be a big mine shaft well that's kind of what he was saying mm-hmm. and yeah. it could and, and it, honestly it could be both i mean there's no rule that says like you know uh caves and mine shafts can't coincide sure. where somebody starts to mine out of it or whatever whatever it is i mean just to see like a, a creature like that with somebody else where you both think you see the same thing i mean oh man and, and that, multiples, would, that would haunt me yeah and and, and, and and two sets of three yeah and and then the markings of various yeah, he occult said the, things he said the sigils and stuff mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yep yep so he just said, like, there were various bits all over. And mm-hmm. I love that he said that at the beginning, like, I knew what I was looking at because I was a kid who became obsessed with death and occult right, and right. all of that and religion, you know. So he would know that versus, like, hieroglyphics. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he knows what he's looking for or looking at, I should yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't doubt that it was um, some type of a, a, a cult kind of, you know, writing symbols, whatever, you know, like different mm-hmm. things. And the, <sighs> marking, the marking of the... Um, the demon or the god of lust. Uh, yeah, I can't remember his name. I thought it started with the A. As Asmodeus, the um, demon of lust. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different things with that where it's like my mind goes where, you know, I've looked into occult stuff, you know, quite a bit. And, and part of me thinks that it's kind of, uh, oh, like a lot of propaganda, mm-hmm. you know, against kind of like more, quote unquote, pagan beliefs that get lumped in with satanic beliefs. And but I, I don't know. I, I, I mean how credible all of it is but then if i'm going to open my mind to aliens and these other things it's like yeah what if what if they're what if there is some crazy a, fucking beast that uh, you can conjure crazy, up i know i know that's what i was thinking i mean part of me would like laugh at that stuff and just think it's kind of like goth kids trying to spook themselves sure wearing robes and doing like silly little like incantations mm-hmm. but i mean god can you imagine how that would just change your world if you were out yeah uh, part of some kind of circle. You make all these markings. You light all these candles. You're like, oh, you know, whatever. And then you see some fucking creature like that appear. You're never the same after that. That's why you don't fuck around with it because you don't know what is out there. So you don't uh, know what you could conjure up. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah. And this poor guy, he says, like, the other guy, John, like, has a drinking problem. Sounds like he's probably, like, oh, dude, I would, anxiety, I, I would, probably depression. Because I, because I, part of me is so cynical and part of me is so, like, skeptical. Yeah, that's what he says, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that if I, that would haunt the shit out of me because I would just be, like, I think about my teeny weenie in comparison to this, a stupid faucet. Like, how did the faucet go on? Right. You know, like that, like that stuck in my head Ugh. for a long time. If I was in that bathroom and I saw a fucking werewolf satyr creature thingy, was, uh, that's, I'm, oh man, I'm, I'm worried about my sanity for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Like I'm worried about a lot of things for the rest of my life. Well, and I, I mean, like. And they saw it together. So that's less about like mental illness. Right, right, right. And he says like. Which is scarier. He's, you know, very pragmatic, really, you know, errors on the side of science, not, doesn't sound like he's into any religion whatsoever, right? So he's, like, so set in this, like, facts kind of way of thinking, but even he's like, it just doesn't make sense. Part of me really wants to see something like that, and part of me really wants to never, ever, ever see anything. Uh, I I don't want to see anything like that. I wouldn't mind seeing, like, a loved one, you know, or... Mm. Like something that I could, someone, but something in a I could, nice way. Yeah, that I could look at and recognize, like, oh, hey, Aunt Joyce, good to see you. Love you too. You know what I mean? Like something like that. But I don't want to see this fucking beast thing. My brain takes everything dark always. Of course. So, like, in my brain, it's like I see, like, the loved one. And at first, they're like, it's like, oh, my grandma's still. Yay. And then she just goes, and I will take you. You know, like, so I'm like, no. It's like she's a monster. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah, my brain always takes those turns. Yeah. Wow. Well, thanks for the stories, yeah. everybody. My God. Creepy ones. Well, before mm-hmm. we go, yeah. I have the sweetest shout out oh, yeah, you have shout ever. Outs. I just have one. I just have oh, one sweet little shout, shout out, out. Um, from Peeper Bonnie to her man, MC. Bonnie says, MC, I love you and I miss you. I can't wait to see you when I'm healthy again. I won't be lost for long. And I just want to say, Bonnie, I got your email. And for the sake of your privacy... I hear you, I see you, and you're going to be okay. Oh, that's very sweet. Well, I'm a nice person. You are. Yeah, I feel like I feel like there's a okay. I mean, er, now now I'm not sure who the monster is going to get. <laughs> it's going to get you. <laughs> we all know. Everybody knows that. Like, if we put up a mm, poll, no. Oh, well, we could take. I mean, we could take a vote about who's who, the monster is going to get first. Who is the most wholesome and sweet? That's like not even a question worth asking. Why would we waste people's time? <laughs> That's all for today, you guys. Uh, thanks for <laughs> continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Please check your emails about the uh, the book. Book at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan and Kate Keith on social media, badmagicmerch.com uh, for the merch design, producer Sophie Evans for help and story curation, Joe Paisley and Zach Flannery for producing, directing, adding, and creating custom sound beds, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want even more content at Scared to Death Podcasts. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. Uh, enjoy your nightmares, creeps, and peepers. Get better right now, Joe Paisley. Can't wait to have you back in the studio. Oh, we miss you, man. Yep, we miss you. Hope you uh, were, not Joe, the rest of you, <laughs> scared to death. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scare.